It's super glamorous all the time. And while it is a lot of fun and I have the best job in the whole world, it's still a job. Mm -hmm. Just because that wasn't my experience doesn't mean it wasn't theirs. Absolutely. So I actually want to know, what is the biggest misconception that people have about being a supermodel? I think a really big misconception is maybe that it's super glamorous all the time. And while it is a lot of fun and I have the best job in the whole world, it's still a job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have to put a lot of time, energy, work, effort into doing my job. But I love it. So it's it kind of goes hand in hand. But yeah, there's not some not so glamorous and, and fun parts. Okay, but that's what makes it Tell me about the not so glamorous and fun parts, because I, I have the same conversation when it comes to entrepreneurship, because I think when people are looking from the outside in, they just assume that it's like a lot of like really cool things happening with your business and all these opportunities and da, da, da. But of course, like I think with every job, there's like really yeah. not glamorous bits. So yeah. what are the things in your industry? I think for me, personally, in my own experience, it was the beginning of my career that was very difficult. Mm -hmm. When you are first starting out as a model, you do a lot of work to, to build image and like build your book and gain experience. So you're just sort of people are hiring you and, and you feel like you're just lucky to be there in a sense. And you're not getting paid like a crazy like everyone thinks you're just like raking it in from day one. But that's not always the case. And I think in the very beginning, putting in the that time, putting in that effort, you know, paying your dues mm -hmm. in a sense and going on all the castings and you have callbacks and you go back and you see the same people multiple times before they book you and then you get a call and then the very next day you have to fly to a different country. When I was young, that was the craziest thing in the world. I was like, what do you mean? I'm going to Sweden. What? I've never been there. So like it was scary, but really exciting at the same time. But I think those are the things when you're first building yourself up and like gaining experience in in the modeling and fashion industry. It's pretty um, grueling days, like really long hours, you know, putting in a lot of work, running around, doing everything. But I loved it. And it's also a part of what makes it really fun. And then now looking back, it's what makes me have appreciation for where I'm at now and, and my job and what I do. So it's it's like both. They go together. I love that. <laughs> so you were scouted at, what, 14, if my 14. notes are correct. That's yeah. insane. What yeah. was that even like? How did it even happen? Like, how did your life change? It was really, it was really strange, <laughs> my scouting experience. I was in my hometown in Colorado, and we live really cl close to what's called a dude ranch. And I feel like there's a different definition of what a dude ranch in, is in pretty much every state, and everyone has said something different. But the one that was close to me was almost sort of like a functioning Western <laughs> YMCA in a sense. There mm -hmm. were pottery classes there. There were archery classes. There was horseback riding. You could do all sorts of stuff and activities because there wasn't much going on where I'm from. And um, I didn't know this at the time, but that location, that specific ranch was used a lot for commercial photo shoots like mm -hmm. JCPenney's this um, department store called Belks used to shoot there a lot. And uh -huh. then um, I was there with my family and there was a photo shoot happening for Belks. And the photographer and the assistant thought that I was there to be one of like the kid models. And she like came up to me and was like, oh, are we like shooting you tomorrow? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> shooting me? Like, what do you mean shooting me? <laughs> Like target practice, I was like, What's "Oh my happening? god, that's so funny!" No, I don't know, not that I'm being dramatic, but um, so then they were like, "Oh my gosh, um, where are your parents?" And I was like, "Oh, my mom's over there." And um, they went and spoke to my mom, and then they actually booked me, and I did shoot like a couple pages and images, like four pictures in the Belks catalog the next day. Yeah. Oh my gosh! So, so like, it was like Fast and Furious. Yeah, because they they really liked, I guess, the way that I looked. So then I shot it. Uh huh. And then yeah, I just I. I kind of went from there. So that's how it started with me. Did you ever think you were going to be a model when you were younger? Like, what did you want to be? I didn't think I would be a model. I knew what modeling was because we had America's Next Top Model. Oh, my God. The best. I grew so up on that. That's what I thought it was. I thought 
modeling was America's Next Top Model. I thought that competitions and things like that was how you get into modeling. Mm. So when it happened for me like that, I was a little, I didn't really trust it. I didn't really understand it. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I wasn't very good in school. I, uh, I, I loved to read. I loved English class. I liked writing, but I didn't really know what that meant for me because everything else was really difficult and I had to try really hard to stay on top of my homework and schoolwork. So I was worried that I didn't really know what I wanted. I loved art class. I loved drawing. I liked all the things that I guess you're just sort of told as a child don't make you money or aren't a career, Mm -hmm. quote unquote. People are listening. I'm doing air quotes, (laughs) not a career. Um, So I had no idea what that meant for me. I didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to do. I was only 14, so I did have, If looking back on it, if I hadn't been scouted and didn't become a model at the time, I would have had time to figure it out. Oh, and totally. I think, 14 years so young, you know? You know, so I look back on it and I just, I really don't know. I don't think I was developed enough to have an understanding or like have a real passion for anything that meant, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to pursue this. Mm-hmm. So when modeling came around and I started doing it and I loved it, I was like, oh, Great. So <laughs> this then, is what I do. <laughs> so then after that first catalog came out or you shot that first photo shoot, was it just like love at first experience? For me, yeah. I wow. loved it. I just felt like this is where I belong. This uh-huh. is what I'm supposed to do. I, I get to miss school. <laughs> I was like, I don't like school. Like this is <laughs> this is so much more fun. Yeah. And then, you know, they sent me to New York. They told me that I needed to meet agencies there. And I met like 11 agencies and ultimately signed with IMG because I knew that there was t- like supermodels were signed at IMG. IMG is like a big deal. A big deal. So I, I went there and I've been there for 14 years. Like since I was 14, I've been with IMG. Wow. And um, I just, I kept f- traveling the world and I would book things. And like I said, I went to Sweden a lot. I shot for H&M Divided, which is like the kids or like teen, like the younger line. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of that stuff. I shot for Forever 21 and it was just like it was really fun and I it was it was there were long days e-com days you just you stand all day long on a white background and try on anywhere from 50 to 100 looks but like I, I would rather be there doing that than sitting in a classroom not moving I don't know I feel like I got to just like move around a bit because I was the kid in class and my legs always shaking and like I looking at the clock like when's lunch <laughs> it was perfect for you then <laughs> all the 30 in the morning you just got here at lunch is it for another four hours I was like oh get me out of here so this is perfect for you <laughs> yeah so then you know what I'm curious about is oftentimes when people come into success at a young age they don't like they can like lose I guess like they're they, they, they like they're no longer tethered to reality a lot of the time, yeah. you know, like they're no longer down to earth because something happens to you. Right. Yeah. Like and we've seen this time and time again with a lot of child stars. But then there's also the flip side of people like yourself who are very down to earth. You've obviously like developed a work ethic and have kept it for such mm-hmm. a long time, 14 years. I mean, that's no small feat. So what like what allowed you to stay grounded? I think for me, it was my family Uh and the people I had around me. I think your your team, your environment is really super important when you're that age, when you're that young. And I think a lot of it is about what, you know, your your relationship with your family or your parents or um, any sort of parental figure or what's the word, I guess, sort of a guide in your life. Mm -hmm. I think if they're putting the time and energy into teaching you things and how to become an adult and be aware of the the environment that you're in, who's around you and like how to treat others. Then it's a little, you know, you're more likely to stay true to who you are, feel a bit more grounded. I also have three siblings. They were not going to let me act like that. They were like, who do you think you are? Every single day I was like, okay. Okay, Taylor. You know, I was I had no checks room. and balances. Yeah, Check, exactly. It's just kind of like I go home and I just, I just was me. I mm-hmm. was still the same old Taylor, and I felt like my family was completely unfazed and did not care about any sort of success or growth in my career. Not that they didn't; they were proud of me, but it didn't affect how they felt about me or viewed me or treated me. So. I love that. That's like that's really beautiful, and you're so right. Like I do think that 
family has such an important kind of they're like an important force in your life, yeah. especially when you don't necessarily have like the grounded bits of actually being at mm-hmm. home. So having that influence is incredibly important. Yeah, it is. It was probably what, you know, defined me as a person now. I mean, I always, I was really young when I started. So don't get me wrong. I was a teenager in the beginning of my career. And in my, you know, late teens and early 20s, it was just like growing pains, mm-hmm. just like anybody else trying to figure out who I am. What do I like? Who am I? You know, I look back on myself then and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> Ooh, shut up, you idiot. I don't know. Like if you're not like cringing at your oh, then 18 year old self, like then you haven't grown. So I feel like even though I I have like more of a sense of groundedness and maybe wisdom <laughs> now, I didn't always have, have this. Of course. I always felt like I was grounded and authentic and wanted to be myself because of my family but I was a kid you know it's like I'm sure when I was you know 20 doing stuff on set people were just like oh my god this girl's so young you know so I know I look back I was I'm like oh, I like see old interviews of me or something and I'm just like oh my god this little child I had no idea so of course I mean I think it's like to say with any career you know when you start out like I for example look at the first box that we had for Ray and I'm like what the heck was that you know or like listen to my first ever podcast episode and I like still remember I was like so sweaty and red in the face because it was my first <laughs> interview nervous. so nervous like I didn't ha- yeah like you, you don't you don't have the skills or I mean you're just starting out yeah but, so it's like of course you should be cringing at yourself and being like what the heck was I doing because otherwise yeah. I mean where's the growth you know yeah. So talk to me then about obviously you had this like very strong influence from your family who were amazing and they've obviously shaped you into who you are today. But did you have any, I guess, negative experiences from the industry or your peers the same way that I guess we would when we're growing up? Because you grew up in the industry and most people like a lot of people grow up in school, you know, and they like face all of the things with like the bullies or like, I don't know, the the um, pressure to fit in in a certain way. Did you feel that way in the industry as you were kind of growing up in it? I I personally did not. I feel like I got to be myself. And as I was growing up in this space of fashion, people are so understanding, or at least that's been my recollection and, and the people that I've gotten to work with. I feel like they... Also, my mom came with me everywhere. So Mm -hmm. that's also a really important piece of my story, I think, was having my mom there, showing people on sets that this is a 15-year-old, this is a child. She has a parent with her. The dynamic was different because when you're 15 and you're in an environment around adults all the time and you're wearing adult clothes and being dressed up and acting like an adult on set, people tend to forget that you're not an adult. And having my mom there to be like reality check constantly. She needs to sit down. She needs to do her homework. She needs to have a have lunch. She, you know, she's a child. I think they kind of had more of an understanding of, oh, like this is a kid. <laughs> we need to remember that, I guess. So for me, I felt like they were really um, great at encouraging me, teaching me, making me feel comfortable because, you know, I was never modeled before. I don't really know what I'm doing and showing me, you know, how to pose, maybe do this, directing me more, guiding, helping. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I got a lot of support from people around me in the industry to become comfortable in myself, like teach me how to do my job better. And I don't know, I feel like my experience growing up, I felt really... I felt really safe and really excited. I don't know. I, I loved I loved it. And I love that. Yeah. That's, that's really, really nice. And like amazing to hear because I think that oftentimes when people kind of look into the fashion industry specifically, they, I mean, obviously like everyone's experience is different and yeah. everyone's experience is so valid. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's really nice to hear the variety of stories, I yeah. guess. And like also understand how your family managed this whole thing for mm-hmm. you going into it so early. Yeah. I think that I I've I know some of these stories. I've heard them. I've met people with negative experiences or an uh, a traumatic story. And it doesn't 
just because that wasn't my experience doesn't mean it wasn't theirs. Absolutely. And I have a t- I completely understand that and I think that's something that I always talk about is I there is there is this. It does exist. There is an, a negative part and piece of the industry, mm-hmm. but I don't it just for me it wasn't it didn't feel like that and that wasn't how I experienced it and I had a great time. So just because I had a good time and my positive, you know, experience, I hope that doesn't negate or neglect like somebody else's story because I can see how two things can totally be true at the same time. And just because one person, I had a great time and I had a fun time doing it and I grew up and I felt so much joy and fun and I was, I felt really safe and protected and I got to have my mom with me. That's the first step. That's probably where things go very two different paths can Mm -hmm. happen is I had a parent with me. I had someone, you know, to, to guide me and help me and protect me in modeling. 95% of models. That's a, I made that up. I don't know how many (laughs) percentage of models. I don't know. A lot of them don't have that. They don't have parents with them for the most part. So it's, it's true. It can, if you're not able to like fend for yourself and have the ability to think on your feet these girls are 15 they don't know how to do that all the time some of them do some of them are stronger and they get it i have so much like love and respect for for models in the the industry and i saw them in castings and i you know walked shows with them and sat with them on the floor with my mom and they were alone and i i know that how they felt like i i don't know know how they felt but i i can see how Mm -hmm. it two things are there's two very different so then when experiences when did you start doing things on your own without your mom? Was it at a certain age or like had you reached a certain point of maturity? I think I started traveling alone when I was like 17 and a half, mm-hmm. maybe. She felt comfortable with me going off on my own at that point to certain places if I had been there before because she's taken me there. She knows the client. She sees, oh, she's working with h H&M. and I know where she's going to be. I know what the situation is, what studio, what photographers typically shoot there. And then um, usually when around the time I was 17, my older sister started traveling with me instead That's of my so mom. Nice. And by older, I mean 13 months. <laughs> I was 17 and she was 18. So <laughs> some chaperone, you know what I mean? <laughs> An 18 year old. She took a gap year from school and she traveled with me for a year. And it was the most fun I ever had because I got to do things a little bit differently because when you're with your mom, obviously you're on your best behavior. But when I was with her, she was she was like a, a second mother to me, even though she was only a year older than me. She did guide me. She did look out for me. My sister is very strong and very independent. Don't mess with me. Don't talk to my sister. <laughs> Don't look at her, you know. But she's fun, you know. She's 18. And we had a really good time. And, and I... I loved it. I look back on those times fondly with her. Oh, I love that. So when did you end up moving to New York? I moved to New York when I was a almost 18. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you fell in love with the city right away. You knew that's where you wanted to live. It was a bit of an adjustment. I didn't I didn't love it right away. I think New York is a really amazing city, but when you first get there, it can be a bit tough. If you're not used to, you know, a big city, lots of noise, you know, public transportation, taking the subway. I was like, what is all this? I had been there with my mom a lot. So she did teach me how to like do all that stuff and learn the ropes of how to get around in New York. But um, it took me about a good year and a half to get used to it, find good friends, you know, make a good community, build sort of a routine there. And then after I developed those things, I I fell in love with it. And I loved New York after like a good almost two years. As someone who is a model and who has been for so long, like, you know, you were, as you said, like constantly traveling on the go. What were the things that you put into your routine that allowed you to feel connected to a city? Like, how did you go about making friends and having those routines and just like, I guess, developing rituals that allowed you to feel like still grounded, even though you were on the go a lot? I think for me, it was doing some sort of exercise or a workout class or um, going to the gym. Mm -hmm. I think I I used to do gymnastics, not very well. I was horrible, but I had so much fun and I loved it. And um, when I started, you know, traveling a lot and modeling, I obviously like quit sports. I dropped out of school. That all kind of went away. But when I started, when I was living on my own and I sort of realized you have to create a structure for yourself, 
I loved working out. I sound like a crazy person. No, you don't. I feel the same Everyone's way. Everyone's like, oh, you love working out. Okay. No, but I think it's about finding the workout that you love. Yes. You know, like it's not just anything, but when you find it, I think a lot of people can relate to this, right? Yeah. It can be tennis. It can be strength training. It can be Pilates. But like yeah. you have this moment when you find that workout that you love that you're mm-hmm. like, oh, damn. Like, I like this. Yeah. And I like I like a few things. And I got into like a couple different workouts and I've taken so many classes, like every class under the sun, you know, I love exploring and figuring it out. But um, I, I think that always... Doing some sort of physical exercise. That's a part of my morning routine. When I'm home in New York, I would go do that. And then um, I also got a dog <laughs> when I was yeah. 18. Which was and I, be that I was very irresponsible of me, but at the best 18, decision I ever made. You know, it's funny that you say this, right? Because <laughs> yes, like at 18, there was nothing I wanted more than a dog. But my parents were like, they like dissuaded me. Yeah. Okay. And now I'm in my 30s, like my early 30s. And now I'm like, I don't know how people with dogs do it. Like, I love dogs. And I told you like before we started that one of my team members, Alexa, she has her dog, Brixton, which I will show. He's like my little, like he's like my nephew. He's so cute. (laughs) But I'm like, I I love him so much. And I see him every week and he like lights up my life. But at the same time, I'm like, you're like a mom. Yeah. Like you're like (laughs) looking after a whole life. Yeah. Taking so, care of something and making sure it stays alive. Yeah. It's so so I think when you get into that habit at 18, it's almost better because then mm-hmm. it's like a part of your norm. And like there's not a big adjustment that you mentally feel like you need to make because it's like at 18, you're so malleable, I feel yeah. like. So I didn't right, overthink it. I guess. Yeah. And right yeah. now I'm like, OK, well, what do I do? I'm traveling so much. Work is so busy. What do I do? You know what yeah. I mean? So t- tell me about this decision to get your dog. <laughs> this is Tate, right? Yeah, Tate. Yeah. yeah. It was... I, so you said, you know, you wanted a dog when you were 18 and your parents were like, no, don't do it. I didn't tell my parents. It was very secretive. Very smart. I told smart no girl. one. I was like, hmm, that's a cute puppy. I want it. And I got him. And I was like, well, that was dumb. Why did I do that? <laughs> what am I going to do? How did I-? I texted like a picture of the puppy to my mom. And she was like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> interesting choice. I was like, oh, she's so mad at me. <laughs> um, but... I just, I fell in love with him. I literally was just, I met him and I was like, you're perfect. And I, I don't know. I just had this like connection and I, I, I was lonely. I lived in New York. I was 18. I had been traveling for four years. I was away from my family a lot. And I was, you know, I wanted a companion. I grew up with dogs. I love dogs. I, I'm crazy. You know, you hear me talking. I love dogs so much. And um, I just looked into the eyes of this little puppy and I thought, well, this is my soulmate. I don't know. <laughs> it's That's so, so crazy. Cute. but It's not crazy. It was a part of, um, he was also like a huge part of how I, who I am. And like also in me becoming, you know, who I am because I, I, got him when I was so young I think that um I was able to you know learn so much about responsibility and being accountable and um taking care of someone other than myself and um teaching I had to teach him how to be a good boy I didn't do I he did most of it I think he knew he was like oh gosh this this girl (laughs) I'm gonna need to do a lot of work here um and I think he was a really huge part in helping me feel um, stable, grounded, having a routine, having a life and something beyond my career because it can suck you in, you know? It's so, it's just, you go here, you do this and you just, sometimes you could get lost in it. And I think having something to look forward to coming home to someone and I can't wait to see Tate. I can't wait to, you know, take him to the dog park. I can't wait to have my morning cuddles with him and I would miss him, you know? And I think having that feeling of I want to get back home it established New York as my home as where I wanted to be because I had him with me so I think he was a a really big part of of that I love that and (laughs) honestly I think a lot of people diminish the impact that a pet has on their lives and you know like I don't have a dog, but um, my husband and I and my husband's my co-founder. And we always talk about like our co-workers dog, you know, and we're like, we love him so much, you Mm -hmm. know, and I really do think like, 
you're right. Like it allows you to care for someone outside of yourself, especially in those years. Like I think when you're in your early 20s, yeah. like you're, you're you're so selfish, yeah. you know, so it teaches you to be selfless at an earlier age almost, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think I think it. Yeah, is responsibility. Even when you have a childhood pet, you know, Absolutely. I had two dogs and we all had um, responsibilities when it came to taking care of the dogs, you know, the chores in terms of what it meant to clean up after them, feed them, walk them. We had we had to divide that amongst ourselves. So I was already kind of used to the idea of that and knowing what that looked like. But obviously, like having a dog of your own is a very different thing because mm-hmm. 100% of the responsibility of of that living creature is on you. So it's, I was like, oh my God, what have I done? But I loved it. And it was the best. <laughs> so you started your company, Tate and Taylor. Mm-hmm. Obviously, like he was a huge part of the reason why you started it. So can you tell our listeners what made you decide to start the company and kind of like your journey with Tate? Tate was the reason why I wanted to start the company. Um, he's, uh, he's, oh gosh, he's my best friend. And um, my journey of my life with him was so special and uh, I've always wanted to create something and make something of my own. I've loved, uh, you know, growing up in fashion, just sort of seeing how everything was made and collections and designs and everything from production to the day of the photo shoot and all the bits and pieces and elements that go into creating something. Mm-hmm. I was always so uh enthralled I don't know what the right word is just like over what like I just loved it and Mm -hmm. it was so interesting to me to um to see everything sort of come together so when I about two years ago I started developing Tate and Taylor because I was um just sort of thinking about my my life with Tate and I had a couple of friends who got dogs and they were coming to me and they were asking me a lot of questions what should I feed him how should I train them? How did you train Tate? He's such a good boy, you know. Uh, so, someone I, someone I, I know really well actually like got a dog just like Tate because they fell so in love with Tate that they were like, I need a dog just like Tate. And and then they were like, Can you be around my dog so that he becomes like Tate? Like <laughs> so funny. Um, I'm like, but Tate is his own individual. You know what I mean? They have their own personalities and they become who they are just because they're like children, you know, Mm -hmm. when the child is born, you're like, yep, that's who they are. And uh, that's kind of what how Tate was. And it just kind of sparked this idea of, wow, I feel like the, the consistent thing that I'm feeling or hearing or learning about the pet space is that there's not a lot of information for new pet parents or even people who aren't new to it. Maybe they've never had this breed of dog before maybe they're facing challenges they've never had to with the previous dog so I feel like there's a lot of unknowns in the pet space and um even I felt like that as well like when I first you know had Tate and he came into my life I was just like what do I do what's crate training he's crying do I take him out do I leave him in there and and you have to like google all these things like the results are so like contradicting don't do this take them out like I was like oh my god what (laughs) um so I just really felt like it would be my goal and my my biggest um kind of motivation in my life is to create something that I wish I had when I first got Tate where I could kind of curate like the best of the best products and like new and cool innovative founders who are also doing amazing things in the pet space because it's kind of just like all over the place but there's so many amazing people out there doing amazing things and there's no one to sort of be like hey this is the this is the best this and I love this because of that reason it just doesn't exist and um I just love the idea of being being able to create community because gosh when when Tate got sick even I didn't know what to do, where to go, how to treat him. And, you know, trying to get an oncology appointment was impossible until uh, he was what felt like on his deathbed. It couldn't keep down water, laying on the floor, like not breathing. And I take him to the doctor and she says, you should take him to the emergency room and they'll take him up and he'll see an oncologist today. And I was like, well, why didn't no one tell me that 
a week ago, I've been calling trying to get him seen by an oncologist, but there's like a hack of like, if they're really sick and you take them to the emergency room, then they'll send them up to oncology right away. I was like, no one says this. So like, this was sort of my frustration and just like going through what I went through in Tate's, you know, um, later life. And when I look back on his early life, there's just so many things that I wish I knew. And um, a long-winded way of saying that's sort of why I started Tate and Taylor is just my mission is to create a space and build community so we can communicate with each other because I think knowledge is power, information is the key to everything. And, you know, hearing and knowing someone else's experience with any sort of issue or problem that you're having with a pet or a dog is something that not a lot of people have access to. So I, I love that. And oftentimes I think that the best businesses are built from that personal desire to solve a problem. Yeah. Um, I hear it time and time again from successful founders that, you know, it was it was actually like personal, you know, yeah. and like this is personal to you. And you're mm-hmm. right. You know, like w- like even now when I think, OK, like I want to get a dog at some point and I'm like, but where, like, you know, where would I go? And like, it's amazing that you're kind of like solving for that and having a centralized space for people mm-hmm. to go to with all things pet. I actually yeah. think that it's a very unsolved problem. Yeah, it's cr- I mean, so right now we don't make any products of our own. We just sort of source and curate, look for yeah. and curate the best of the best. And everything that's on our website right now are founders that I believe in, products that I believe in, things I used to use with Tate before I even knew the founder and then started Tate and Taylor and was like, hey, I love your product. And then, you know, I we hop on a Zoom call and I talk to them and I hear their story and I'm like, oh my God, there's so many amazing people out here who just want to do something better like we have a brand on the on the platform now called floof and it's a grooming business and I used to use the um I mean I still use them obviously but with Tate I used to use the wipes because they're dermatologist tested they're hypoallergenic and when he was going through chemotherapy um he had a lot of gastrointestinal issues and the chemo kind of like comes out it's really graphic but like it comes out like through their comes goes through their body and like passes Mm -hmm. through their system and I was having to constantly give him baths and wipe and he was getting you know diaper rash and I had like a cream for him but the only wipes that worked the best and didn't irritate him were those wipes and it's just like it's such a well thought out business his story is that you know his Frenchie was having skin issues and everyone kept telling him it was maybe something to do with the diet or this or that and turns out it was the grooming products like creating problems with the skin Mm -hmm. and then he was like well I'm just gonna make something because I can't find anything that's good enough Mm -hmm. so it's just it's so cool to see like just like you said founders creating something based off of a problem that they had it happens all the time in this in the pet space but I feel like you you never hear that no you never hear those stories like why they're doing what they're doing so I'm like how can I be like this works so well this is like so great and like just shout it from the rooftops and just connect people with great products and founders and kind of just be like a a space where people know that everything here is very well thought out. So have you heard of the brand Jinx? Yes. So my friend Terry, she's the co-founder and she's actually one of my best friends. And like this, the way you speak about pets yeah. is exactly how she speaks about her dogs yeah. and her cats. So Dog people, you know. Yeah, I should I should really connect you. I feel like you guys would be like friends right away. I would away. love to. <laughs> I've heard of Jinx. I, I've used Jinx. They have a lot of um, training treats that yeah. are really great, high quality, like yeah, super I'll, I'll amazing. I'll put you guys in touch. You will like, she will love you. You will love her. Like, I mean, I feel like mm-hmm. you guys have like very similar energy. And oh my gosh, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, so talk to me then about what happened with Tate. So you found out you go to the ER, I guess, mm-hmm. and then you find out that he has some sort of a cancer. So actually with Tate, I um, felt like something was off with him for a while, like maybe two weeks. Uh-huh. He was acting strangely. Um, he he was drinking a lot of water excessively. And I was like, well, that's really strange. I don't, that's not normal. Maybe he's I took him on a long hike the other day. Maybe he's still thirsty. Like, I didn't know what was going on. This is why we Ugh. cut. <coughs> it's not this live. This cough is the bane of my, my existence. My husband I can't has get rid this of right it. now, too. I can't. It's been three weeks. I don't know what to do. He's on two weeks as well. Are you having wellness formula? A what? Wellness formula? Mm-mm. Oh, Taylor, you need to get that. I, I don't know what. I mean, I'm like. Yeah, wellness <laughs> formula. You can get it at Whole Foods, honestly. <gasps> so. 
and I need something. I'm so, like, what okay, is you're, going on? If, and now it's like in my nose, I have no other symptoms of like yeah. colds or anything except for this cough. Si- it's like a sinus. Yeah, so and have like, that. And um, okay, this? so you have to have like, since you're already kind of like sick, mm-hmm. you have to have a lot of them. So like the the max dose is four times a day, six capsules. But I promise well, I you like, that. <laughs> no, like <laughs> I, I would do that. And honestly, you're better in like three days. It's, it's crazy a because miracle it's, thing. it's been with me for three weeks. She's been around me. My husband's been around. No one else is getting sick. Yeah. And I'm just it's like, not, like not it's contagious. literally just me. It's like, I'm just here coughing. I was like, what's happening? Yeah, get that for her. And then there's another really nasty ass cough syrup, which really works, which I'm going to find the name for and send it to you. But you get that at the natural that. food store. Oh, Both of them are incredible. That's what I need. And then wait, have you tried Beekeepers Naturals? Get the I've throat tried. spray for her. It will it will oh, yeah. really heal you. I've used that before. Yeah. Yep. Have okay. that every day, like a few times a day. We love yeah. our wellness queen. <laughs> Thank God I came here today. <laughs> I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, I can't laugh without like <coughs> you poor thing. <coughs> uh, I'm like, I'm like, I'm not gross. Oh, please don't look at me. It's don't look at listen. Me. So my, my husband is the same so right now, currently. So oh. I understand he's not contagious either. So like, I think it's something that maybe like yeah, going around. It, was like some, it maybe was at some point in my yeah. body, and I was like sick, and then yeah. now I'm just like it's lingering and it yeah. won't go away. But I don't oh. care. So you don't need to feel bad. So oh. we'll just get her these things. She'll be fine. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. I, I, well, I lost my train of thought. Where was I now? I don't know. <laughs> keeping count of things um and then he started doing things that were very not tate like so i remember one night a couple days into me being like what's going on with him he started having incontinence and peeing in the bed which uh-huh. like he would never do so then i was like okay something is really wrong i took him to the vet and they were like it we need to run a couple of tests because we don't really know what it could be so they did a blood test they did a calcium test they did all kinds of things to him and I'm not really sure exactly what because this was over a year ago now so I'm it's the details are beyond me mm-hmm. um but so then they they ran the test it took about a week to get a lot of the results in and um I'm trying to think how it all went down so then they they sent me back the results a couple days later and they said that his calcium levels were really high they wanted to do another um, blood test that was a little bit more in depth. So we went back, they did that. And in the meantime, he's getting worse and worse and worse. He's not eating. He's losing his appetite. He's really lethargic. He's laying on the floor most of the day, sleeping, looking like he can't really breathe. And then before the final um, test came back in, um, I used to do this thing where I would sort of grab his shoulder and be like, you're so chunky. And like, just like squeeze him a little bit. And then like kiss kiss him. And I was doing that one night with him. And I was like, oh, so chunky. And he used to love it. And he would be like, oh, yeah, I'm chunky. <laughs> and I would like grab, I was like, grab, and, like it's like a little squeeze. Like it's not, uh-huh. I'm not squeezing him hard at yeah. all. And it's just like a little, like a little love squeeze. Yeah. And he sort of like tur- whipped around, like turned his head and like kind of like tried to bite me. And I was like, whoa, huh. oh no, he's in pain. Yeah. Like he's in physical pain. It's not like an immune, he's not like kennel cough sick. Like he's in physical pain because mm. he's, never bit me a day in his life yeah he's not an aggressive dog so i take him back in you know and i still haven't gotten this test result back and i go back in and i was like he tried to bite me last night he's in physical pain something is wrong something on his body is wrong like that is a very weird thing and they were like okay so they did this test where they like take his head and like move his neck like really far to the left Mm -hmm. really far to the right and they're pushing really, really hard. And when they turn his head, I think I think it was to the left, he like winces and he's like, huh? like yelps. And they're like, oh, and like kind of like snarls. And they're like, oh, it looks like maybe he could have some sort of like a kink in his neck. Maybe we should do an x-ray. And I was like, okay. So then I go in and they do an x-ray and then they come back and they were like, okay, I we know what it is now. He has, we think he has lymphoma, a uh, type of cancer because we did the x-ray and there's a mass on his lymph node in the left armpit area, which is kind of like where I'm grabbing him. And like when they're doing this, it uh-huh. hurts, hurts him. It's it's swollen. It's like pressing on his chest. And uh, they were like, you need to schedule an appointment with an oncologist to confirm that he has lymphoma. But based off of 
some of the blood tests we've done, the high calcium levels, this makes sense that mm. it's cancer. And I was like, what does this mean? And that's all they told me was schedule an appointment with an oncologist to confirm that it is cancer and they'll begin treatment at an oncologist. And I was like, okay, <laughs> any recommendations? Like, where should I call? Like, wh where do I go? Like, what are, who are, who are the oncologists in New York? Like, can I call every single one? They told me of two. I'm like calling both of them. The next available appointment is one month from now. I was like, what? This is crazy. So I'm like calling and calling and calling. I'm like, I think this is an emergency. I think like my dog really needs to be seen. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry, sweetie. There's nothing we can do. The next available appointment is one week from now. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if this can wait a week. I couldn't. Then the next day after that, he's like, he is like, Looks like he's gonna die like he's so sick he's laying on the floor he's like not breathing i could just tell he was like in a lot of pain he didn't even like i felt like it was he was so sick you know that feeling when your skin hurts like you've ever been that sick yeah. I feel like that's how he felt like he didn't he recoiled from touch he was in pain so i called the doctor and i was like they won't see him for a week he's like i don't know what to do and then they were they then they finally said take him to the emergency room, tell them that you think he has lymphoma and maybe he'll be seen by an oncologist today. And I was like, okay, thanks for telling me now, like three days later. Mm -hmm. So we, we do that, we take him in and then sure enough, they send him up to oncology and then that's when things started getting much better for him. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was treated at the, an the Schwartzman Animal Medical Center in New York. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the best hospitals in the entire world. Wow. And it's a um, one of the largest, if not the largest nonprofit hospital for veterinary pet um, animal care in the entire world. And the oncology department is incredible. And my experience there, once I finally got there, was then positive. Mm -hmm. And they were amazing with him. And I got to have an extra amount of time. I had about another month with Tate that I wouldn't have had if it wasn't for them. Wow. So then, you know, losing a pet is really not easy. And do you have any words of advice for anyone who goes through that, like dealing with the grief? Because, again, I don't want people to ever feel like that grief isn't real because yeah. a connection with a pet is so real. It's like your yeah. best friend mm -hmm. and you know, it, it's such an important part of your life. So yeah. any like any advice there? I would say exactly that. I would say my advice is don't belittle your grief. Don't invalidate your pain to yourself or let others, you know, because an, a thing I, I did face a little bit was, well, he's a dog, you know, kind of like not a lot, but it was something that like a, I did kind of get, a vibe where it's why is she still so upset about this dog and it's been almost a year and I still cry about it I still miss him every single day and I don't think that I will ever get over it quote unquote like move move on air quotes mm -hmm. for the listeners I, I don't think it's something that you move on from and something that really 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 stuck with me was when I did do Jay Shetty's podcast he said to me that a friend of his told him that grief or pain or going through something like that is sort of like carrying a stone or a rock. I can't remember exactly what he said, but mm -hmm. it was something along these lines. And at first it's really heavy, it's really hard to carry, but after so many time, after so many years or after so long, you get stronger and stronger. And while the stone is technically not getting lighter, you're getting stronger and your ability to carry it becomes a little bit easier and easier each day. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was such a great analogy and a really amazing way to put it because it never leaves you. You're always carrying this, this stone, this rock, this weight, right? But life and experience and time, as you hold it, you get stronger mm -hmm. because it's just a weight that you're carrying. Just like with exercise, you start with five pounds, five pounds becomes too light, you work your way up to 10 pounds, 10 pounds becomes too light and you get stronger and stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. I think we can emotionally become stronger when we go through these things. So it's not to say, oh, you'll move on one day. Maybe you you most likely never will move on. It will be something you carry with you forever, mm -hmm. but you will get stronger. And it 
it's sometimes really hard to hear that right away. Oh, will I? You don't know. You don't know where I'm at. No, no one knows where you're at. Only you know where you're at. But take it day by day, step by step and promise it's just it's the way it works. You will get stronger. So that's kind of my advice. That's really beautiful. And I think <laughs> a lot of people will appreciate hearing that from you. Um, you got another dog recently, yes. no? Yes, he's I did. really beautiful. I, he's, I like did some stalking. He's a stunner. <laughs> he's a gorgeous boy. <laughs> so do you like, are you like loving having a dog again? Yes. <laughs> it, it was, um, I was nervous because I didn't know if I would ever be ready. I sort of felt like I will never love anyone ever again. And especially I'll never love them the way I love Tate, which is true. I will never love anyone the way that I love Tate. That love, that relationship is so singular and individual to Tate. And I probably will never love anything else like that. But the love and relationship and, you know, the the way I feel about Salem is very different and that's a good thing mm -hmm. and he's been an amazing blessing in my life and he's actually helped me a lot with with the healing process because he's just so different and he's he just he he still gives me companionship I, f I felt like a connection to him right away when I when I first met him and he's been an amazing support and being able to feel that love and joy in the sense of I'm developing my own language and connection and and this bond with someone in a new way was really healing mm -hmm. and makes me appreciate and love Tate so much more. So I, I Salem came into my life at exactly the right time and he was exactly the right dog to help me feel um, strong again. I love that. That's yeah. really, really beautiful. And I think also really important for people to hear when they lose a pet, you know, because I'm sure like what you felt when you lost Tate, I mean, like it can't just be you, right? Like I'm yeah. sure other people have felt this way that like, how can I ever love another pet again when I yeah. had this connection that was so special? But like hearing from you that you're able to develop a different relationship with another pet is like, it's really nice. It's it's also at your own pace and at your own of time. Course. Because obviously for me, it was a bit sudden. I was like, what am I doing? It was maybe one to two months after I lost Tate. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit fast and mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting that. But like I said, for me, it was the perfect timing because I was devastated and I, I was low energy. I didn't something felt like it was missing in my life. Obviously, Tate was missing, but something else. I was like, I miss this, this feeling, this bond, this unconditional love, the the way you talk to a dog, the way they look at you, the way they become such a, a part of you, they mold to your life. And then the next thing you know, you can just look at them and they're just like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, I love that. I loved that. And I miss that so much. But if you're not ready, then you're not ready. I mean, I didn't think I was ready, but then pff, in he walked and I was like, oh, maybe I am ready. I don't know. Have you seen that those there's this TikToker she has, I think, two Rottweilers and yes, Nala. Right? Oh, my God. Is it Nala? Yeah, it is. Nala. Yeah. It is the cutest thing I have seen on the Internet where like it like the paw I love over her. here. And she was she's like. I know they didn't want to play with you today and they were I, scared of you and you can she's like oh I was oh, like I was crying when heart. I saw that video I was like I was like this is not my dog and I can't I stop like, crying she's <laughs> so sweet and I love her so much she's oh my just god like, she's just, just this big baby it's really know? cute everyone should go look this dog up because it is so cute yeah, and oh. I've seen her I love I love that account I yeah, love her she's it's great. really great okay so and you know what like actually just to finish off this specific thing. Mm -hmm. I think what's really special about your story with Tate is that he gave you purpose to start a business, which yeah. is honestly such a big milestone for anyone. Like mm -hmm. this is your first business, no? Yeah, it is. It's a big deal. Yeah. It's a big fucking deal. It's a huge deal. Yeah. So. I'm grateful to him for that. I mean, I, I'm, I wanted to make it with him mm -hmm. and I did start making it with him and I, I love him and I sort of see this now as a way I get to honor him and, you know, his, his legacy, legacy lives yeah. on and I get to see his face every day and say his name every day and I feel like he's still with me. I mean, they're always with you no matter what, whether or not you start a business with them, like mm -hmm. they are still with you. But yeah. I feel really close to him still because I talk about him every single day yeah. and I see his name every day. So for me, it was 
it it was really important that I got to do that and that yeah. I get to have this. That's really special. Okay, I want to take like the next five, seven minutes to answer some audience questions because mm-hmm. we got a bunch. Okay, so the first one, at what stage in your career did you go from walking shows to attending shows? Oh my gosh, I feel like that happened kind of recently. I think before COVID in 2019, I took a bit of a break from walking shows mm-hmm. because I had been walking shows since I was 15. So I, you know, you take a step back because Fashion Week is twice a year for a month. And it's really fun, but it, it feels really long sometimes. And you're away from home for a month and you know, you're doing something every single day. And uh, while I enjoyed it, I, your girl was tired. And um, so I took, you know, a little bit of a break and then COVID happened and the whole world just shut down. And then once things sort of started coming back up again, I felt like people were inviting me to sit at the shows. And I was like, well, that's new. <laughs> I've never done that before. And I honestly really don't know why or like how it happened, but I I was like, okay, sounds fun. Like I used, I'll watch it. Like I've never really watched it before. So I started doing that and it's really fun and it's a really different experience. And there are some shows that I still walk, but I mean, I like doing both. That's super cool. I don't cool. have a preference. <laughs> um, can you describe a day in your life during one of the fashion weeks? A day in my life. Well, I mean, it depends. Every day is literally different from the next. But on a really busy day, I mean, you're up at sometimes six in the morning because if you're attending or walking a morning show, you have to call time is 6 a.m. Like the Chanel show, it was 6 a.m. call time. And I think the show is at 9 a.m. And uh, you start there and you you do all that. And then if you have more than one show that day, then you go from one to the next and you try and have lunch somewhere in the middle. And then uh, maybe there's an event that night or you have to get ready for something in the evening, whether it's a dinner or sometimes there was like a, a French Vogue thing or um, I can't mean it's all, I'm drawing a blank, but it was really, they're very long days sometimes. And then some days there'll be a, a day where you like don't do anything. And then you kind of get to have a free day in whatever city you're in, which is always really fun because if it's like, if it's Paris, then, you know, I get to do some fun, cool touristy things and walk around Paris. And if some of my friends aren't working, I can meet up with my friends and we have breakfast together. And then, you know, maybe go take a peek at the Mona Lisa. It's (laughs) it's fun things like that. So it it really can vary. It just, it really just depends what your schedule looks like and how many days you're there for. I love that. Okay. I actually have a question of my own. When you are having these like super long weeks or days or months during fashion week, how are you keeping like your skin and like yourself really healthy? Because I mean, I'm just sitting Mm. here and I'm like this girl's skin, like it's it's insane. It's been luminous. (laughs) It's been a, been a, been a journey, the skin, you know? Um, I definitely fall off the wagon a bit mm-hmm. more. So it's like, it's more just having my consistent routine mm-hmm. when I'm not working like that, that creates a, I guess, durability of the skin. So then when I go through the hard stuff, it kind of is easier to maintain, mm-hmm. but it's difficult. I mean, it's, you have makeup being put on and wiped off maybe three to four times a day. Wow. And, uh, I think the most important thing is I like to keep it really simple, like just a few things. And I use a lot of the same products. So while the makeup and the brushes and the technique is always different, my face wash at the end of the day, my my cream at night, my cream in the morning is always the same. Okay, you have to tell us what those are. Uh, my day and night routine are a little bit different. Mm-hmm. I'll probably Maybe I should start with the night routine. Um, I use a face wash from a brand called Skin Farm. It's amazing. Um, She's a friend of mine. She has a clinic in uh, Nashville and they're kind of all over the place, but she makes amazing products and is a nurse practitioner. So she's like, she knows. I use a lot of her products. So I use a face wash from her. It's the gentle foaming or gentle cleansing face wash, something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, she's going to be mad at me that I don't know the names. (laughs) That's fine, a face wash. But it's a really easy, it's a really gentle face wash. So I use that at night. Oh, well, shoot. I take my makeup off with Mm -hmm. micellar water from either Garnier or Bioderma. Personally, I feel like they're all kind of the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And then I cleanse with that face wash. And then at night, I use a hyaluronic acid serum, also from Skin Farm. It's called the Youth Serum. That is my top favorite product. If there's anything you should buy or get or use, I think it should be that one. And then I use a a night cream. And it really depends. And it's it's different every t- like a cup co- every couple of months or depending on the season. In the winter, I'm a very very dry dry dry. I have very dry skin, and I love the Waleda skin food. It's I've heard really such good things about it. It's really thick, so p- like please be careful and check it out. Make sure it's for you because it's not for everyone. I will preface that like mm-hmm. it really isn't for me. It really works, but again, everyone's skin is so different. Like it really is. It's so, so individual skincare. Mm-hmm. That's what's so difficult about saying what I do because I'm like, ah, I'm gonna make something break out. Oh boy. <laughs> um, so do do or don't use that. Mm-hmm. That's that's up to you. That one specifically, <laughs> maybe not for you. It's for me, but it's maybe not for you. Um, in the summer months when it's hotter and I sweat more, I like this cream from Epicurin, the brand Epicurin. What it's called, I don't know. It's a cream from there, yeah. It's a cream from there. And it's nice. It's it's like a little lighter. It, it has more of like a, like it feels cooler, sort of a watery texture. It smells like oranges. I really oh, like love. it. It's citrusy. It's fresh. Mm-hmm. So I like that. When it's the summer, I use that during the day and at night. And then another cream I really love that I have on rotation is the Aven Sickle Fate. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Probably not. Um, but I love that one because I feel like it's more of a barrier cream or a restorative cream. So you're meant to use it if you have a sunburn or some sort of skin damage and it heals. So even though I don't have some sort of severe thing on my skin that needs healing, I think because I put my skin through a lot, Mm -hmm. there's always some healing that can happen. You know what I mean? Totally. A little bit of healing. (laughs) So I just use like a little bit because it, again, it's so thick and it might not be for everyone. So just make sure. Maybe like spot, I don't know. Like, yeah. Sw- like what's the, can you like test it or honestly try it out? Like, I, think, I don't want to tell people something and then yeah, they're like pissed listen, at me. I think the thing is that like everyone who comes on here, like the advice is so specific to them. And I see the same yeah. thing with my skin, right? Like what works for me may not work for somebody else. Yeah. And I think everyone knows that. So yeah. this is not... This is not gospel. <laughs> yeah, so so that's night. Day is pretty similar. The only different difference is I add in a vitamin C serum. So I I, I wash my face, gentle cleanse. I, I do the vitamin C serum and then the hyaluronic acid Wait, and then the day cream. where's your C serum from? Oh, uh, right. I have to tell you where it's from. Um, I use two. I really like the one from Cora Organics, which yeah. is Miranda, Miranda Kerr. Kerr yeah. Hers is really good. I it really like it. It is super good. I agree. Um, or I use the IS Clinical. Is Clinical? It's IS so Clinical. good. Oh my that God. One's Both really of those good are too. phenomenal. Really good ones. Um, and I really like them. And then I, use an, I do use an eye cream at night, but again, I just kind of, I, I switch it up. I don't really mm. know which one is good. And I don't know if they all really work. Yeah, you know What's, which one is really amazing. I is, need to figure it out. Have you tried the Shawnee Darden one? Mm-mm. Oh my god, it is so freaking good. That one, and then there's um, One Skin. Those are my two favorites. Mm-hmm. Oh, so good. I need to. I need to. I need to get more into the eye cream situation. I mean, I do use a couple different types, but yeah. like I. I'm inconsistent with it. Yeah. I need to be better. Yeah, fair. I mean, <laughs> you know, he's like, you you go to bed and I do one, two, three, and yeah. then I, and then I'm like, ah, shoot, I forgot <laughs> eye cream. Ah, dang it. Um. Anyway, we'll get better at that. I'll come back. We can do another one, and I'll tell you which <laughs> eye cream I use more consistently. An update, <laughs> and I'll do an update, part two. So yeah, that's and then a sunscreen. Sunscreen in the day I yes, use. Absolutely. I love either Supergoop or I use one from Epicurin. That's my favorite. Mm-hmm. That's the best one, and uh, it feels like. Uh, face cream. It feels like Ooh. a moisturizer and it's super glowy and I like the smell and I like the texture and consistency. Oh, I'm going to check out this Epicurin one. It's not a light. It might make you out. So just be careful. Well, I still want to check it out because I mean, I feel this just, sounds really good. Just be careful. <laughs> I will warn you. Okay, last question that we have time for. Any tips for aspiring models? Okay, let's see. I would say have patience, you know, be yourself stick it out. I know it's tough out there. And just 
if, as long as you're having a good time and you're loving what you're doing, just keep doing it. Just mm -hmm. keep doing it because the hardest part is, do I give up? Do I quit? I'm not, am I going to make it? I know in modeling, it's a lot of it is timing and luck. And I'm just kind of like, oh my God, I'm just lucky to be here because it's just so crazy. I have no idea how I got here. But I would say that those are the most important things is just have patience. And as long as you're loving it and you are doing what you love, honestly, my, my, my biggest belief in life is do what you love and the rest will come. I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay, actually, follow up to this question is, do you remember the moment where you felt like, oh, my God, like this is this is a big deal? Probably. Probably the Victoria's Secret fashion show. And how far along were you into your career when that happened? I was four years in. So see, like, this is what I want to zoom in on that. Like, I think people start something and then they're like, oh, like year one, nothing's happened. For this is four mm -hmm. years four in years that in. something monumental happened for you. Like, that's that's a long time to yeah. be doing the same thing and like keeping at it day, day after day. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I was working really, really well and I was doing great stuff. I was proud of my career up until that that point in my life. Mm -hmm. But Victoria's Secret really changes careers you know it creates a whole other avenue a whole other lane your career goes in a whole other direction i'm where i'm at where i'm at because of victoria's secret and i'm so grateful for them as a brand and and they're they've been like a family to me and i feel like i get to sit here today and like do what i'm doing because of victoria's secret so booking that and seeing the response and being like oh my things are different now and it was, uh, yeah, it was amazing. And I'm, I'm, I appreciate, I love them. I'm grateful. I still remember actually seeing <laughs> you do one of the shows, like when, like back, uh, like 2017, 2016, something like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like it's like, a, it was, it really made careers. So it's yep. super cool that you got to experience that. It was amazing. And it was fun. And it was, for me, my experience, you know, again, like this is my personal experience of it. It was just, I had the best time and Aww. I made some of, the best friends I've ever made. And I I look back on that time so fondly and and with it's just like a sparkly moment in my memory. So I love that. That's really, really great. Um, Taylor, this has been amazing. Tell yeah. everyone where they can find you. Where they can find me? Mm -hmm. On Instagram, oh, oh. all the social media, oh, you can, website. Oh, you want to find me? Okay. <laughs> you can find me. I'm Taylor underscore Hill. My my company, Tate and Taylor, is at Tate and Taylor on Instagram and TikTok and our website, TayandTaylor.com. And I have a TikTok too. I don't know what it's, I think it's Taylor underscore Hill too. I don't really, I post on TikTok, but I don't really look at it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. <laughs> it's a whole other world for me. It really is. Thank you so much for being here. This was so fun. Yes. Thank you for having me. That was great. Thank you.